us tonight two speakers. They, we have facilities here for them to both be amplified at the same time and both be taped at the same time. So if they wish to answer some questions afterward at the same time, uh, they can do so. Uh, they've worked together quite a while now, so it may be that they go on a time about fair play basis. Uh, Mr. Miller, the architect of this group, will speak second, and Mr. Wheeler will speak first. When I found out that Ewing Miller, who has the firm of Ewing Miller Associates in Terre Haute, and if any of you have been to Indiana State lately, you will have seen uh, some of uh, Mr. Miller's firm's buildings, the latest dormitories there, and as well as some other work. Uh, I don't know whether your dormitories are finished yet or not, the really big high rise of cast concrete, it's not ready yet. But when I found out that he had a psychologist on his staff and that uh, he was using this psychologist not only for evaluation of their buildings but also in the design aspects of the buildings I thought that uh, that we would all be interested in hearing what they had to say so without uh, any more introductory remarks than that, I would like to uh, introduce our two speakers, and I'll introduce Mr. Miller first, although he will speak last. He was born October 5th, 1923 in Toledo, Ohio. He was educated at the University of Pennsylvania with a Bachelor of Architecture in 1947 and a Master's of Architecture in 1948. He's practiced in firms in Philadelphia, in Terre Haute, and in London, England. He now has the firm, and he's president of the firm Ewing Miller Associates in Terre Haute. In the awards that he has won, he would include the Indianapolis Home Show International Competition, sponsored by the AIA, he won first prize in 1951. He has been a guest lecturer in many places, written many articles, including uh, uh, Aesthetics for a Liberal Religion, which was presented, printed for distribution to Unitarian Universalist building committees, and also written in the AIA Journal, a uh, an article on behavioral sciences and architectural planning for human factors analysis. This was December of 1963, and I believe that was in collaboration with Mr. Wheeler. He has exhibited uh, not only watercolors he has done, but also his, his architecture. And very interestingly, he's, he's uh, married to uh, to a girl who also happens to be an architect and practices at home right off the kitchen with some very nice houses the last time I was down there. Mr. Wheeler, uh, it's interestingly interesting that he wrote up his biographic data. His uh, uh, Ewing starts from the time he was born and Mr. Wheeler's ends up, ends up with the time he was born, so he starts off with the present. At this point, he's professor of psychology at California State College at Haywood in California. He's been in many different institutions, including the Carnegie Institution, where uh, he worked uh, in Teddington, England, completing four experiments on induced color. In 1958 to 1963, he was a research associate at the Neuropsychology Laboratory, Indiana University Medical Center. From 53 to 58, 
He was an industrial engineer, head personnel testing and training department, head photographic and photo engraving laboratory, editor, company publications for Sarks Tarzian Incorporated, Bloomington, Indiana, and electronics firm. He has been at the University of Washington, Indiana University. He has served in the Army and, interestingly enough, was a classmate of Mr. Miller's at the University of Pennsylvania School of Architecture in 1941-1942. He's a member of many, many professional organizations, and I, uh, with a list of publications and uh, research that is quite fantastic, uh, ranging from color vision and induced colors to human relations in business and industry. I thought you might be interested in the courses he's teaching at California State College right now, include elementary psychology, elementary laboratory, perception, attitude and opinion surveys, social psychology laboratory, response processes and psychophysical methods laboratory, and also teaching honors independent study in psychology. So I think we look forward uh, tonight to a very interesting explanation of how psychologists and architects can work together. Mr. Wheeler. Thank you, Chair. I hope, uh, hope I get this little doodad hooked on so it doesn't fall off. What he was really saying is that I'm an architect that failed. <laughs> <laughs> or at least failed to stay in the field until I got uh, excited about it in my old age and came back to it. And I'm glad to be back, at least on the fringes. <clears throat> I'm also glad to see you all out here tonight. It was daring of you with the rain. I'm <clears throat> That's in spite of the fact that part of your grade may be contingent on this set of programs. <laughs> <laughs> Am I talking loud enough for you to hear in the back row? No? More. We often say, don't we, that the solution to an architectural problem is a design. And then we have a jury to decide which design is best, or perhaps the architect himself is his own jury and decides among his own designs. Now am I coming off at the back? Okay. I want to change your way of thinking about architectural problems. A design or even a finished building is not a solution. The true problem in architectural planning is prediction. The solution to prediction problems exists in a complex space that's acted upon by three sets of variables. These three are program contingencies, design choices, and planning criteria. Each set affects the other two, and all three together generate a space in which planning solutions are to be looked for. Let me develop this idea a little. When somebody asks for a building or a set of buildings, what happens? First, I think we try to get exact information about program contingencies. We say, how much money is there? What are the site characteristics? What behavior is to occur in the building? <coughs> we look at cost limitations, site data, and functional requirements. These are the basic program contingencies. With the program in hand, we begin to make design choices. We make structural choices, aesthetic choices, and choices about spatial relationships. These engineering, aesthetic, and spatial 
relations represent selections from among a tremendous hierarchy of possible choices. We have a design space that is itself made up of at least three large groups of variables. Meanwhile, <clears throat> that is while we're designing, we've been asking ourselves, will the building be sound? Will the building work? Will the building be pleasing? We've been thinking in terms of structural standards, aesthetic principles, and efficiency indices. These three sets of variables are the major, major planning criteria. And other people, of course, will apply these criteria after the building is constructed. You have to live with your own sins if you stay in architecture. This brings us <clears throat> back to the matter of prediction. When we can say with confidence before construction, yes, the building will be sound, or yes, the building will be pleasant, and yes, the building will work, then and only then have we solved the real architectural problem, the problem that exists at the intersection of three sets of parameters, program contingencies, design choices, and planning criteria. The problem is basically and essentially one of prediction. Please notice that the solution space of the prediction problem is exceedingly complex. All the program contingencies may affect each other, all the design choices may interact, and all the planning criteria are interrelated. And then, of course, all three of these bundles of parameters are mixed up with each other. Architecturally or mathematically or psychologically, the solution space of the prediction problem in architecture would be hard to match for complexity. I don't really wonder that so many of my architect friends are gray-haired. Well, why is it important to look at architectural problems as prediction problems? Why should I insist that a design is not a solution, but only represents one of the three parts of the real problem facing the, psych the architect? Excuse me, my biases show all too easily. <laughs> all this comes about because I am a psychologist. My own field is the prediction and control of behavior. My thinking is structured in terms of accuracy of prediction about behavior. And my work consists of attempts to organize environmental variables in such a way that certain behaviors will be highly probable and others will be highly unlikely. I think that last sentence also describes an architect's work pretty well. Don't you strive to design buildings in which work or play will be maximally efficient, pleasant, comfortable, in which irritation and annoyance and efficiency will be minimized, to which people's emotional responses will be positive. These are all behavioral outcomes that may be made more or less probable depending upon your planning solutions. Manipulating the probability of behaviors such as these is what you really attempt as architects. This is the real problem that you try every time to solve. The design on the drawing board is not a solution. It's a part of the essential problem of predicting and controlling behavior. You and I, because of this, face almost identical professional problems. We have to make similar efforts in our work. <clears throat> Perhaps if the goals of architecture and psychology are this much alike, the psychologist can bring something useful to the solution of architectural problems. 
what forms would this help take? Well, with respect to program contingencies, for instance, psychologists are supposed to be specialists in observing and describing behavior in functional terms. When you need to know what goes on in an office, a school, a factory, a hospital, or in a home, so that you can design spaces that will enhance and support particular functions, the behavioral scientist is your man. Psychologists, not to mention our friends, the sociologists and anthropologists, are trained to observe <clears throat> and categorize behavior in ways that will permit quantitative description for experimental purposes. This is exactly what is also needed for programming analysis. I'm bound to note, on the basis of a fairly extensive acquaintance with the architectural literature, that functional requirements for program use are not always adequately defined today. I also know it because the architects that I know are always screaming about the inadequacy of programs. Controlled and quantified observation <coughs> is, <coughs> I'm sorry, is therefore the first area in which I assume that psychology might be useful to architecture. <coughs> then with respect to the parameters I've called planning criteria, there are techniques in psychology that should be of some value. If you want to predict whether a building will be pleasing or whether it will work, it will be necessary at some point to find out whether buildings in fact were pleasing and whether they did in fact work. For these investigations, the behavioral sciences have developed correlational techniques that offer considerable promise. Surveys and questionnaires properly designed, indices of efficiency, accuracy, and speed of behavior, <coughs> evaluations of comfort or convenience, <coughs> All these can be worked out to fit architectural needs. Case studies in depth, field observations, journal records, <clears throat> film or television tape recording can be adapted to the process of validating architectural planning criteria. I'm gonna take something for this hoarse voice and if it makes me mumble, I apologize, but there's nothing I can do for it. Don't you wish you all had a piece of candy? especially with dope in it. <laughs> you can only get these in England. I can't buy them in this country. Relatively little has been done along uh, these lines so far. So answering the question, how good were my predictions, is the second area in which I believe psychologists can be useful to architects. And what about design choices, the third bundle of parameters? Here I really think the psychologist, as a scientist, may ultimately <clears throat> make his largest contribution to architecture, because this is where experimental techniques and methodology appear to be most needed. Here we would like to know about the effects of changing or varying an element of the constructed environment. What happens to behavior when illumination or color or texture or sound damping or space relationships are manipulated? What must we do to ensure that only the variable we're interested in is having an effect? How do we take into account the facts that humans easily adapt to environmental stimuli and that they often are not aware of the variables that control their behavior? When is it important to consider these things 
in attempting to evaluate design alternatives experimentally. Applications of the experimental method are the third large area in which psychology may make itself useful to your profession. I've been speaking sort of high-handedly, I think, but I wonder if it's really legitimate for me to speak of architecture and psychology as having so nearly identical goals. I view architecture as the profession of designing space for the support and enhancement of specific behaviors. I believe that architects are vitally interested in behavior with respect to habitation, education, health, commerce, industry, government, recreation, religion, and transportation, to name a few major areas, because they design buildings to accommodate behavior in each of these areas. Psychology, the science of behavior, not the science of mind, also has many subfields of interest in behavior. Some of these, the average non-psychologist doesn't really know about. Among them, I could mention experimental and statistical psychology, learning and conditioning, sensation and perception, physiological and comparative psychology, personality and social, clinical and abnormal. This last set is the one that the layman most often equates with psychology in general. Industrial and consumer psychology, education and military. The list could be enlarged, but those are some of our oh, areas of interest in behavior. It's my hope that a category of architectural psychology will not be long in appearing. And in fact, it really has appeared already. There are about 50 listed psychologists in the country and perhaps a few more or less sociologists who have um, made known their interest in <coughs> architectural problems. <clears throat> to demonstrate the kinship between our professions, I want to talk a little bit about some of the consulting that I've undertaken for Ewing in the past eight years. His firm has had a continuing program of behavioral research to implement and improve its design decisions. This program has been based on the idea that constructed environment has effects upon efficiency of behavior and that these effects must be taken as basic criteria in architectural planning. It took me several years to coax him into this point of view and after that it began to pay off. An early problem concerning <coughs> concerned the complex office operations in a set of truck, trucking company terminals. Several terminals were to be built and the different managers having different backgrounds in the, in the trucking industry, each wanted a considerably different type of terminal. Now this obviously, as you would suppose, would present much larger than necessary design problems. Our position was that the job functions in the offices of all the terminals were probably substantially similar and that there should therefore be an optimum design applicable to all terminals. Now, this hypothesis is not necessarily um, a perfect one. We took it as an operating statement. On this basis, we undertook systems analysis in terms of flow of communication among the various job functions in several trucking offices. We were able to show that despite differences in management style, there were important degrees of similarity among the operations of the offices we studied. 
This investigation enabled us to produce a vector analysis model that defined an optimum arrangement of the various job groups in a prototype trucking office. Do you want to show that slide? Is it to? First one on. Yeah. That'll be slide for this. Yeah. Never mind. Never mind. I'll kick the pitcher of water over next, and then everything will be about up to par. <clears throat> the vector analysis was, was computerized, and it took account of all the information flows in terms of the frequency and importance of each category of information in the office and it connected the office functions with the terminal dock operations. Studies of this kind are time consuming, they're expensive, and they require access to a number of operating systems of this sort under analysis, but they do produce basic data that are extremely valuable for planning and design. And I'm sorry the bulb blew out because we have a floor plan of a, an office that was designed with this mathematical model, and it looks real fancy. I drew it myself, except for the draftsman who intervened. <laughs> A second problem area to which the firm has applied behavioral <laughs> research is the design of college residence halls. We've conducted an extensive series of habit and preference analyses with at present something over 2,000 student respondents. And the results have led to improvements in a sequence of residence halls. Color applications, elevator service, study spaces, recreation and lounge areas, flexibility of furniture arrangement, and many other environmental factors have each become successively more efficient and more livable as a result of a continuing feedback from the program of behavioral research. This is part of what Mr. Miller is going to talk to you about, and that gives me the happy privilege of skipping from page 8 to page 16, which I now do because in there it tells you all about what all the students liked and disliked, and it's fascinating information, and we'd get out of here at midnight or something. <laughs> I also uh, mention in the material that I'm taking care to skip at this point something about some research that we plan to do in a mental health center in Terre Haute in which we're fortunate in having 16 offices that are all very much alike and 20 rooms for patients that are all very much alike. And we should be able, because of this, to do behavioral research on the effects of this clinic environment as it relates to patients under various kinds of therapy. We've set up the design for this research and we we pray fervently that we get to do it, but it takes money and time, and we're not absolutely certain. And then there's a discussion of some research we're doing on office design. <clears throat> Sometime this winter, I expect about 240,000 bits of information to descend on me, which will bury me completely out of sight, but I have some student assistants who will dig me out, I hope, and uh, we should know more about the effects of about 40 variables on people who work in offices than anybody has ever known before. In fact, I think we'll know more about offices than anybody really wants to know. But since it's being paid for by the firm of designers who asked for it, we're not quarreling with their judgment. <clears throat> I'll turn now for a while to more general aspects of the relationships between psychology and architecture. 
Well, that was a mistake. In here it says architecture and psychology, which puts the good things first. But uh, what factors are opening up this new area of professional cooperation? On the architectural side of the picture, I think perhaps there are three basic influences at work. The tremendous growth of urban planning as a discipline in schools of architecture has undoubtedly sensitized architects and planners <clears throat> to the analytic methods of the social sciences. <coughs> My English dope is not doing all it should do. Secondly, architecture's clients in government, industry, and education are much more sophisticated than they were 10 or 15 years ago, and they often insist that human engineering is as important in buildings as it is in other man-machine systems. And thirdly, widespread general education in the behavioral sciences has produced a generation of professional people who know that they can turn to these sciences for information and advice. How many people here have had at least one psychology course? Mm -hmm. That's the kind of thing I mean in this particular instance. Why should psychologists be interested in this new field? A few examples will indicate the exciting types of problems that are encountered here that is exciting to psychologists for professional reasons. E.T. Hall, an anthropologist, has written an entire volume that contains psychological case studies and theories dealing with man's uses of space, that is the space around him in his own environment, and the effects of spaces on man. And if you don't know the title of this I'll, I'll let you look it up because that's the mean kind of academic trick people play. Hall's book is something you should read. I have it right here. It's not that I've forgotten it and I'm trying to see. In fact, if you get a copy of this paper from well, Dean Sappenfield, you'll find it indexed in the reference list at the back. And then by having had to look it up, You'll remember it better. That's another nasty trick. Alexander, an architect, has written a book describing a computer-aided topological solution for breaking down complex architectural design problems into manageable pieces. But a basic step in the system requires psychological evaluation of the relationships among many elements of the problem. J.J. Souder, an architect with a team of investigators, has described a computer-aided technique for hospital design, a technique that employs straightforward human engineering methods together with psychological surveys for evaluation of the results. Blaswell, a sociologist, and there are some very good ones working in these areas, has made an investigation of the social psychological considerations in the architectural planning of a large urban bank. Spivak, a specialist in community psychiatry, has published observations concerning sensory distortions in tunnels and corridors, especially as they may affect patients in clinics and mental hospitals. This is something you ought to look up. It's a very interesting article if you haven't seen it. The kinds of visual illusions that occur in long hallways and tunnels. They're enough to make a perfectly normal person go screaming up the wall. And if you take a psychiatric patient and put him in one of these things, you can get some really horrid results. Studer, an architect, and Stay, a psychologist, have written a definition of the goals of the architectural designer based on the premise that behavioral needs must be the governing factor <clears throat> factors in design solutions. 
They came out with this about a year ago, which means that they came out with it about seven years after Ewing and I decided to believe the same thing. So we feel as though we had a little head start. But they have outlined a program for transforming behavioral requirements into a formal system. Now that might not sound very exciting, but what it means is that they have quantified the design situation and the behavioral needs situation sufficiently so that they can state the whole thing as a mathematical model. And that's a big step in the right direction. Foley, a psychiatrist, and Lacey, an architect, have made a plea for joint behavioral research for architectural design purposes in relation to mental hospitals and clinics. They have proposed interprofessional study grants and workshops on a continuing basis between fellows in psychiatry, technical term meaning somebody well along in the field, and graduate students in architecture. That means the same thing. I don't know uh, <coughs> why in one case it's a fellow and in the other case it's a student, but this list might be extended considerably, but the potential gains for cooperation from cooperation between architecture and the behavioral sciences seem to me to be greater than even the foregoing recent work suggests. I'm going to conclude my part of this talk by re-emphasizing some of the contributions that our professions can make to each other. And I really mean that. I don't mean that psychologists can stand up and tell architects what they ought to be doing. This, of course, is ridiculous. They can't do it. But they can say some things that are helpful to architects. And the other thing works, too. Architects, because of what they're doing with the human environment, can say a great many meaningful things to the behavioral scientists. What can psychologists contribute to the profession of architecture? I just want to paraphrase my earlier question. The foremost item in our repertoire is undoubtedly research methodology. Methodology. Now kick it again and I'll... <laughs> Our experimental designs, <clears throat> survey and testing techniques, human engineering skills, and psychosocial analytic approaches. Isn't that nice? Psychosocial analytical approaches. My wife said, leave that out. It sounds like jargon. And I said, that'll make me feel better. <laughs> <clears throat> Can all be brought to bear upon <clears throat> the architect's design decisions. My daughter didn't know what to think. She usually tells me about um, her father's behavior, but in this case, I don't think she cared much. She's just learning to use jargon, so she has a professional interest. Every building or group of buildings, from the point of view of human behavior, represents a multivariate problem. Our methods of research and analysis are beginning to be sophisticated enough to provide useful answers to such problems. The trucking terminal analysis is one such. A second contribution that psychologists can make lies in the knowledge of human skills, abilities, and sensory or perceptual processes. We can already direct the architect's attention to an immense literature in each of these areas. More important, we can help him make a selection within the literature of these areas. We can help him understand something about adaptation levels, learning effects, contrast and constancy phenomena, and other relevant psychological constructs and results. Much that we know is immediately applicable to design decisions. 
A third large area of usefulness encompasses work in social psychology, in small group behavior, and decision-making processes. The structure of spaces to accommodate functioning groups of humans as they work or play is intimately related to these essentially psychological kinds of investigation. We have much to offer along these lines. What can architecture contribute to psychology since these things have to work both ways if there's going to be a useful cooperation? Well, the most important answer is that architectural design problems are to a great extent problems of human behavior and they should therefore be inherently interesting to psychologists. Furthermore, if psychologists don't lend their support to the study of these problems, others are going to do it. The following statement by the architect Swinburne illustrates this point. He said, we all know the WL squared over 8 formula in structural design. Well, I didn't, but somebody told me it was an important bending moment, and I'm willing to take their word for it. I say, and this is Swinburne still, the SIR formula from psychology is far more important to design than any bending moment. One's knowledge about the chain of stimulation, integration, response should be tested in every state board examination. Well, as a psychologist, this is where I pricked up my ears because not all of those examiners are going to be psychologists by any means. In other words, somebody's going to be taking an interest in the psychological problems that in exist in architecture. And I feel strongly that psychologists should be the ones to take the lead in this. I realize that I'm showing a professional bias. In addition, architecture can provide psychologists with ready-made opportunities for fascinating investigations. Whole series of existing schools, banks, offices, hospitals, other sets of buildings <coughs> that uh, differ in only a few ways within each set can lead to extensive behavioral analyses. You can't see it behind here, but I'm down to about the last page. <laughs> Remodeling and rebuilding projects can provide pre and post tests for the examination of numerous hypotheses. Government grants and private contracts to perform this work should be readily available because architectural firms, various foundations, and many government agencies are now alert to the fact that poor architectural design can be disastrous in its effects upon our expanding population. Architects and behavioral scientists should undertake a mutual examination of their related problems. Many current inquiries in psychology and sociology must be enlarged and influenced by the pressing questions that the architect can contribute to the ongoing study of human behavior. I did get to the last page. And Mr. Miller can take over. And I guess we can have questions afterwards, shall we? budget in this school to have another bulb? Do we have another bulb in the projector? Okay, fine. The reason I ask is I can't talk without slides. My psychologist tells me my language is muddy. 
I think my slides are better. I uh, took Lon Wheeler at his word after two years because I suddenly realized that the romance and perhaps the art in a large sense was out of architecture and that the science was coming in. Now, if I'm going to be manipulated, I want to know whose hand's fiddling me. So we're working together. <laughs> I have great concern for the profession. If I thought I could luck out and retire at 65, by the way, he works from a written thing. I work from a few notes. He's better organized. That's why I'm an architect, I guess. So which one failed? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I'd go ahead and practice this uh, thing of architecture as I'm doing it now. I don't think I can last for 28 years. So consequently, we were doing a number of things, some of which I'll show you this evening, or at least talk to you about this evening. We're interested in computerization as a labor-saving device, among other things, giving us better data, more accurate data. We're interested in the psychologist's ability to give us a better program, sincerely, because it, uh, uh, we found that a man trained in this field uh, at least in the investigations we've done so far, uh, has a better ability of not getting involved with the strong personalities. And I think that this is uh, oftentimes what architects do. They, 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 they talk to one or two people who head a company or who head an institution, and they really don't know how this filters down. We've had too many merit award buildings in America end up non-usable. And it must not be purely the selfish manipulation of that building by the artist to come out into a sculptural form. It has to be that his data was not uh, properly given to him. At least I say that to save the profession some embarrassment. A concern for the profession has been, I think, in such an overemphasis on design that it can almost be termed overkill. It's necessary. Design is that viable thing that, uh, uh, that gives us our delights. And when I say us, I mean everyone, just not the inbred group of the profession. We're not doing architecture for architects. We are doing architecture for humanity. And, and uh, uh, it appears in a cursory way to this unscientific fellow that, uh, uh, that at, at one time in our life, or, or our profession's life, that at one time in this professional life, we all came out of a small little cultural pot. And, and, and when, when the architect made his uh, individual type reputation uh, in this Renaissance period, uh, he, he knew just empirically what his little town in Italy wanted or what uh, a certain section of France was trying to do. And you can see the adaptations of the style as it went, uh, both in plan and in, in uh, uh, the, the structure and the feeling for the building. But today, we don't come out of the cultural pot the same way. Uh, architects are involved with, a, uh, with a, a, a great amount of, uh, of work that wasn't really theirs before. We did monuments and, and, and public buildings and churches and unused things, really, in a sense. <laughs> uh, uh, things that people didn't have to live in. 
they looked on them as focal points and they went in them for a period of time to get a blessing or their head chopped off or something like this. And it, it was, you know, it was a for short duration. But now we're involved in this total thing of environment and we're making some rather drastic mistakes. Now we all know about the arts and architecture building at, at, at Harvard. Uh, uh, I've got some other ones that I'm, I'm going to show you that uh, it's going to be real sort of unprofessional in a sense because I'm using other people's work as a, as a finger pointing, both good and bad. Um, there's a, there's a, a, a housing project in Boston that um, an engineer by the Sep, name of Sepp Fernkus pointed out to me. And he said, you know, this was a prize winner five years ago. It was, it, it was in a destitute part of Boston in the West End. And, and the architect did a beautiful job of really screening out the environment. And he built it in such a way that there were little courts and light wells and the apartments up, uh, went around these uh, five or six stories deep. And I'm quite sure that uh, middle class people would have found it excellent. It's an impossible thing to police when you put Irish and, and, and uh, Portuguese and uh, Puerto Ricans and Negroes all in this thing when they are sub-economic level people. And they start splitting up into their factions and their government things and the prostitutes go on the sixth floor and the families go on the third floor and the murders are committed and everybody disappears when the police come into the casbah. Exactly what it is. Just a, a case of, of, of a man doing in his sincerity a design philosophy that for this group of people didn't work. He was just out of his cultural pot. And we, we are, these things don't evolve anymore. They come about uh, through government subsidy. Man used to evolve his neighborhoods to suit the needs of his policing power as, as one thing by his economic levels doesn't do this in, the, in this condition. And so it becomes, as we've seen in so much of our public housing, uh, uh, a, 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 a crime-ridden, uh, impossibly uh, controlled situation because we have destroyed the sociology by sanitized housing. This thing of an interdisciplinary group um, I guess that, that what I'm saying is that I'm just running scared for the profession. Um, it's a question of whether we are going to be, as architects, uh, in sort of a traditional spot of, of uh, centering at the head of the table with the design team around us all contributing on an equal basis, or whether somebody else is going to be sitting in our position and we're going to be one of the people down at the end of the line that uh, finally gets the project on which the artistic overtones are produced. Um, the Tishmans and the General Electrics, the Westinghouse uh, combines can do this to us. What is even more uh, fearsome as we agreed at our dinner tonight are the RANS and the systems analysis people who have the real toehold in this thing and are apt to take over the whole of uh, decision-making policy in the, in the environment. We're working right now down in Terre Haute with a thing known as the Wabash Valley Interstate Commission. This started out as a group to protect the waters of the Wabash Valley. These run all the way from Chicago on the west side to Fort Wayne uh, on the east and finally end up in Evansville. It's a, uh, I forget how many millions of acres are involved in this. It wasn't more than two years that this commission has been funded jointly by the states, by the way, uh, has been in, in a uh, decision-making position that they realize that they really can't control pollution in water until they uh, get into land use. When they get into land use, they start determining densities. When they get into densities, they want to know what type of environment they're talking about in those densities. So here is the beginning of the regional plan commission that can be a superstructure and, and uh, uh, really spell out environment all the way down the line. 
Fortunately, I guess, we were, uh, uh, the man lived in our town, he knew me, he said, we have a politically appointed commission. What can we do to get people on this commission who can advise us in a professional way on environment? Out of 45 people on this advisory commission, there are two architects, one planner. But there are ecologists, microbiologists, botanists, and you name it, all the way down the line, right down to the political scientist. And these men are more concerned with environment than we are in this total ecological approach. Well, that's the reason that we're trying to work with in this and some of these new sciences. We want to be a part of this decision-making team. Until we can speak the language, until you can speak the language, until you wear their hat, you're not part of their team. Uh, the dichotomy can be carried further that, uh, in that we really, <laughs> the constant complaint that you hear in the profession, whether it's from magazines, at the AIA conventions in the school, is that the public doesn't understand what we're trying to do. That one statement ought to give us a clue as to which way the profession's going. If we're that far away from, from the public, we had better be worried and we had better find out where we have gone wrong in either conveying to them or doing for them. Now, Lon said that uh, many people want human factors research into their buildings. This is true to a limited extent, I suppose. It will become more true in the future. But they want more than this. They want excellent cost control. And we can't give it in the profession. We can if we, if we get involved with the computer. Um, they want follow through. They want turnkey. And so many of the feelings for the profession that we have had in, the, in, in our past of, of ethics and responsibility are being turned over for us. And I think in your lifetime, you're going to see yourselves in the field of being designer builder in a, in, a, in a turnkey situation. I think you're going to have to do it to protect yourself as much as anything from the legal uh, aspects of responsibility that are being forced down our throats that we just frankly, on the, in the terms that we have now with dealing with the public, we can't control. Now, this means that you're going to have to become part of a team to do this. You can't do it all yourself. You can't have all of this knowledge wrapped up in, in, in uh, uh, one brain. So get used to the fact that you're going to work with a team. You're going to be working with a number of disciplines. You're going to be working with a number of other people involved in environmental design that have different goals from your goals. And you're going to have to learn to manipulate them and throw off the cloak of the hurt um, artist and put yourself in a position of hard sales for your reasons for wanting to do things, which means that we have to be more explicit, I suppose, in what we are trying to accomplish. This means that we have to be more explicit with ourselves, Charles, I feel. Let's go through some of these buildings quickly. I have more slides than, than uh, time will announce, so I'll, or let us have, so I'll go through them rather, some, many of them rather hurriedly, and I'll give you an example of how this thing works. When we receive this project, do I manipulate these from up here? No. When we receive this, the, this project of a residence hall, let me tell you all who's involved in it first. The announcement comes from, um, the treasurer of the institution who has his master's degree in business administration. Previous to this time, he has gone to the dean of housing or the director of housing who also has a master's degree in business administration and he's determined what the student can afford to pay by the year. The treasurer then takes it and by working backwards figures how many students uh, uh, it will take to, uh, for the loan that they want to uh, float. And, and um, he, he knows how much money, therefore, he can borrow on this rental return to be paid off at three and seven-eighths for 40 years. So the program rather comes to you 
unlike this uh, beautiful sort of open program you had for your, your school, uh, although that did have a cost limitation on it as well, the program comes to you that we have to have uh, 1,800 students on this site because this is all we can afford with the money that's been given us by a biennium, which is a political subdivision that has absolutely nothing to do with, uh, with aesthetics or planning or control of any type. They are not only divorced by being in another city, but they have absolutely little knowledge of what it takes to put uh, uh, the new buildings on this university. They just know what they can afford from their revenues. So they, they say, this is what you have for land. You buy that much land. This is the real scientific progress, you see, that we're making in our day and age. They, uh, uh, so you buy this much land. They determine they have to put 1,800 students on it, and they give you a total cost. Now enters the picture the dean of students, who is a doctorate in sociology. And he tells you what kind of governmental structure the students will best organize themselves under. Uh, 50 men to a floor uh, is a desirable uh, ratio. Uh, 30 women to a floor is a desirable ratio. So being very good Americans, we compromise at 40 to a floor. The, um, um, the next man um, into the picture uh, is uh, two, two, rather, into this picture then. Both are doctorates in sociology. Uh, this is the dean of women and the dean of men. And they have come to their conclusions that the average square foot need of the student, if you take him as a thumb, you know, is somewhere around 250 feet. They've got this from canvassing uh, happiness in universities over the country. <laughs> They're all up on Wheeler's pills. <laughs> so we now have, by virtue of all of these interdisciplinary actions, we now have 250 square feet and a cost that brings us down to a square foot cost, you see, on what we can borrow. So all of this is determined for us plus the, um, uh, 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 the organization of the floor structure, uh, plus the fact that they have determined at this university that people are really happier at two to a room. They, um, uh, they're not willing to let them try one to a room, but they, they know this, you see. That's one of the things they know. So we have to accept this. And then, then the final man in the picture is the president of the university, and his doctorate is in political science. And, and he's very good at this. Uh, he said, uh, Ewing, I, I, uh, you've got all these figures, and we have to hold to them. Uh, they've they've uh, shown a true picture. But now uh, it has to be a good-looking building. Uh, we've got to convince the taxpayers that we're doing excellent work here. Uh, now, we can't make it too luxurious on the inside, because they might get the wrong feeling that we're trying to spoil these young people. Um, howsoever, we want them to feel that it is an addition and a focal point. And um, <laughs> so we, the only thing that an undereducated architect can do is to hire a psychologist. <laughs> 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 Believe me, there's nothing like a beady-eyed psychologist to look down their throats. <laughs> But now, we misuse him, you see, this way. Uh, I suppose he misuses us. He accuses us always of, of really equating him with this sort of uh, abnormal psychologist, but he really just scares the dean of women right out of menopause, I'll tell you. <laughs> we, we've been able to convince them that you really can't control mores with architecture, you know? I don't give a damn. If you put 100-foot candles out there, it's not going to work. <laughs> So, he's on our side. <laughs> uh, now, we get a lot of good hard facts out of it, too. And, and one, of the, one of the things that, uh, uh, that has come out of this, and I think one of the most interesting things, as you we don't have a picture of the room, but we have given up trying to, to fix any furniture in the room. We've done this for the simple reason that no matter how badly the room is arranged by the student, it's his arrangement. 
And possibly in this overstructured world, and this is my feeling and, and uh, not Lon's, but possibly the reason that, uh, that we're, we are so overstructured and so much that the feedback that Lon was getting from his questionnaire uh, uh, kept giving us indications that they liked this portability, not movability in, in, in the sense that it has to be unscrewed and put around. They might want to move it once a week. I've had to enter rooms by crawling over the bed, but they were happy with it. Now, <laughs> you know, if I say this is in the women's dorm, I'm in trouble, but if I say it's in the men's dorm, I'm in worse trouble. <laughs> There's evidently areas in life, and again, we don't know, where the designers ought to stay away, the professional designers. This may be the same in residential areas. This may be the reason why people buy more from contractors by leafing through magazines than they do from architects, because so many architect then interior houses looks just like you took down the tapes. And, and, and uh, 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 maybe this is an area that when we think of systems for housing people, maybe we ought to make them in sufficiently small components that these people can still form their own environments. We'll get back into this uh, um, after the slides are over. And we've been sitting here looking at this screen long enough, I guess. Well, I hope that's better focused there. OK. Uh, these are the two slides that Lon is going to show you. Uh, these are the link values as he determined in the job classifications. I was interested to watch this thing take place from sort of afar because architects always work with management. Now he went into management and found out what the job description was. Then he went to the person and found out what they thought the job was. And this was two different things. Uh, we are all egocentric, I suppose. Management likes to put itself right in the middle of the most important function, where it doesn't belong. By these methods, we found that management belonged off on the side, because the fellow was seldom in his office. He was wandering around over the dock and, and uh, 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 through the accounts section just to troubleshoot, to see uh, uh, how things were going. And actually, by being in the center where he wanted to be, why he was spoiling the operation of the plan. And this was the plan that evolved with the link values as they see them. I can't go into the thing. It's based on, on more or less of a triangularization of workspaces. Uh, but the, the areas of greatest importance between accounts and dispatch, whether these are electronic links, whether they're handover links, whether they're walking links, are all described and gives the architect just a better chance to do industrial architecture. There's very little romance and art in industrial architecture, but by gosh, you can make it so efficient that people at least reduce their frustrations to the point that uh, uh, they're not just completely worn out at the end of the day. And I think that this is a responsibility of architects in today's science-prone world. I think that we have to get our data in, in this sense. These are the West Residence Halls, now known as the Sycamore Towers. Uh, for Terre Haute. As you can see, they're set right in the middle of an urban situation that is a deteriorated situation. It's, uh, there, it's surrounded by 1830 to 1860 buildings in various states of disrepair. And uh, the Wino Belt and several other belts are right around the... <laughs> So to uh, protect everybody from these evil influences, why we, uh, we knew that it was necessary to get at least the living floors up to the second floor line or third floor line where they had a better view of what was going on. <laughs> <laughs> Parking is a problem that we really don't cope with. Uh, uh, it's, it's, it's just too complex, and we haven't had the cooperation as yet of uh, of the public, really, that has prevented the Planning Commission from, from operating in a, uh, in a total response to this. Now it's uh, uh, with almost uh, 6,000 commuting students, and if you figure that two out of every three are driving, it's to the point 
now where in the next four years we will have the cooperation in developing jointly for the Central Business District and the university parking facilities. The, uh, uh, we have turned these bottom floors in. We actually just sort of blanked off the, the walls and uh, turned them in toward uh, at least a thing that we will create over here when the biennium comes up that gives us money for planting trees. This is a whole new thing that we have to do with our legislators has convinced them the trees exist. I uh, think that you, uh, I, I put some of these slides in more or less because to relieve this whole thing of, of the psychologist and, and the architect, uh, I thought you'd be interested in seeing some of these precast things if you haven't been exposed to it. This is the plant. This was a shock baton method on a vibrating platform, which gave us very good results. The plan in the remainder of the city block that was given to us uh, presented a very difficult situation. Uh, we had to go high rise. One thing that we found out from Lon's survey before we did this was that there was an ambivalent attitude on the part of the student. They really didn't seem to care whether they didn't have strong feelings. Now the, the Ivy League colleges where the students are, are cultured in, in megalopolis have very strong feelings about high rise buildings. They, they just don't to, uh, take to them. But uh, here, our student coming mostly from uh, farm and small town regions uh, rather looked forward. There was just a little bit of a slop over, wasn't there, on the side of being in a high rise, sort of sophisticated urban setting. So we were fortunate enough to be able to increase our densities by coming up and then providing all the common facilities in, in a ground floor uh, building. Uh, the social areas are on the first floor. Now, I only want to point this out to you that we, we brought a stairwell down in the center of this social area. Previously, we had put this into one big room on, on our previous building. And although it was well received because of its decoration and color, and we did separate an active area from a, uh, a sort of sofa uh, area by um, a, a very a uh, nice uh, fireplace screen. Uh, nevertheless, the, the complaints came back or were registered that it was just too much of a fishbowl. You just didn't feel that you had the privacy. Well, now this, this is a serious thing because this, this did bring in the Dean of Women that said, we ought to be able to survey an entire social area by somebody at the desk just looking it over. Well, my God, by the time you get to the university, why, you're adults. And this is what this survey was saying back to us. I'm an adult, and I want, at, on occasions, to have sufficient privacy that I don't feel like I'm on uh, view uh, all the time. So uh, with this information, we were able to convince for this building uh, this type of an experimentation. We put a fireplace on the wall and, and uh, developed a seating arrangement here. And then these develop around so that you really sort of wander around and you'll find small groups of people. And it's worked much better. And we've had a, a, a much greater reception. We also, because of the continual complaint and overlapping activities, took the activity, the ping pong and the vending machines and things up on a second level over here. You'll see these later on. Now, uh, from the, the survey on the previous building we did, we found that the, 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 the major complaint was noise in a double-loaded cord. We just weren't to the point where we could uh, convince the president when we started these, and this isn't the same president that's there now. When we started these uh, uh, under Raleigh Homestead, he was just afraid that really the carpet was, was beyond the public's ability to accept. The carpet industry had just uh, uh, sold itself nationwide as a luxury instrument. So we split our corridors, got them into single loaded corridors, uh, 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 put our mechanical core down through here. And then we had to, uh, really in our evaluation of our time deadline and our economies, uh, we, after studying four or five structural techniques, we went to a precast load bearing wall along here for 12 stories, a precast pre-stressed floor system, all of this tied back and welded to the in situ spine. This was our first sketch. It was turned down because it's too easy to run over the rooftops. This was the beginning of our second sketch, and, and just the, the, to eliminate the rooftops and make them jump. But, 
fellas, it's more sporty. You must admit. <laughs> this is the first column that uh, uh, came to the job, and I show it to you to show that uh, in precast columns, these weighed some uh, 16 ton. Uh, there was a time in the spring of the year when the state police owned more of these than we did. You know, there's a load limit done on uh, Indiana roads uh, during certain seasons. <laughs> You think architecture's fun? Just wait till you get into it. <laughs> uh, these, are, these are set uh, up on, on a uh, nut uh, bolt system and then dry packed after they're shimmed, or after they're plumbed. They're shimmed on these bolts and then uh, dry packed after they're plumbed. The columns in position, the 32 ton beams uh, swung uh, on after that, and then the first of what's known as the double lollipops uh, uh, going up. The, um, <laughs> Ah, uh, dear, there's so many things in this business of ours. Uh, uh, the, the construction crew started at both ends, uh, putting the beams on, and they got to the middle and they were an inch short uh, to set the last beam. <laughs> Thank God they took the responsibility of supervision away from the architect, and we now call it under the nice name of observation. <laughs> <laughs> well, the crane operator, and, and after a long judicious talk, uh, nudged it. A 32-ton nudge. <laughs> we took down all the beams, we took down all the columns, we went back and we shimmed them all and plumbed them all and started from one end and it worked out that way. We uh, put the floors up on, on uh, scaffolding and swung the lollipops in underneath. Uh, they were tack welded, tack welded to the frame, the in situ frame in the back, and um, uh, then uh, uh, the lollipops are plumbed and the thing is finally welded and then the next two stories goes on. Uh, you know, they're not so far from ballet dancers, really. This is, uh, this is a uh, thing where, uh, uh, really it takes, this, this form of new technology uh, takes great courage. The fellas hadn't done it before, we weren't used to high rise in our town, and you swing one of these double lollipops up 12 floors in a 40 knot wind and, and um, then lean out for it, you know, to pull it in. When it's um, going up, really, the, uh, the spine was a handsome thing. I was sort of sorry to see it all enclosed. It uh, had a very structural feeling to it. Now, these were women's residence halls. And we had really played with this form to give this first residence hall appearance, that in each one of these pieces of filing cabinet, there's an individual, you know. This just isn't a clinic or a hospital or a classroom building, that, that by breaking up this little plasticity, by, uh, by uh, 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 showing these things, that we have a feeling more of the residence uh, as we've at least seen it evolve over history. The, uh, um, the structural, the thin little twigs of structure, uh, sort of uh, uh, like a skeleton on an insect, we felt gave it the, the, um, uh, the, the inherent feeling that it is a load-bearing thing, and yet the very def de defined uh, little rumblings back and forth to cast the shadow, the very thinness of it, kept it in a feminine mold. Uh, we were real proud of this. And then one of the sociologists uh, on the staff decided that boys and girls were getting too much alike, so they decided to put them right next to one another so that they begin to tell the difference. And um, this uh, uh, sort of spoiled our, uh, our original plan that this would be all for women. This had to, to fit another function. Uh, it has to be rented out in the summertime uh, for uh, married couples or couples with children and so the interior areas uh, have to be, uh, be able to be blocked off so that they will, uh, will have two bath areas out of it. This is uh, turned into a hotel. You can see the in situ to the left and the setting the double lollipops in on the male-female joints. The tack welding. Um, we had some, uh, you can see the hooks that are cast into the lollipops and then we ran the uh, um, a, a piece of bar through and welded it. Then when the uh, a topping is placed on the double T's, why it uh, comes down in, there's a mold a form put in here, and it uh, comes down in locking this whole thing into one homogeneous piece. We hope. <laughs> <laughs> 
I, really, I'm tremendously pleased with, with this particular material, and, and I'm not touting it above others, but you are able to get a crispness. You're able to build in details such as drip molds. You're able to do so much more, we found, and still remain in an economical pattern. And it gives the architect back uh, at least an ability to manipulate the surface so that it can become expressive instead of the straight curtain wall type thing. This is the entry. We have a very urban situation, uh, high density. We have to use every bit of space. The, uh, these little things become sitting areas. It's a, it's a piazza uh, in a true sense. If we could really find what, what is the vitality between this type of a campus, we could then apply it to the city and maybe we'd solve some of our problems. This place is just alive. And of course, Lon says it's because people are there for the same purpose. They have an interest. They, uh, they have youth on their side, and they don't have a diversion of things that happens out in uh, society to wean us away from the intensity of our cities. We feel that uh, uh, through the able ability to manipulate this in different ways that we've uh, been able to get uh, really a very formal and, and sort of um, uh, urban setting that still is quite humane, uh, uh, quite scaled, uh, this is the platform, the uh, fireplace on the inside. We took the precast material right inside and used it that way. We didn't change it at all from the exterior. We didn't rub it down, do anything with it. The stairways up to the uh, lounges where the uh, card tables are and the vending machines. Looking down from one of the balconies of that lounge area on, you can see how these groupings are made. Some around, uh, there's one around on the other side on a piano, around a piano. Uh, but a, a very much ma more mature way of breaking up the space so that you, uh, you can get out of the public view. And then this sort of last shot of um, how the four have turned out as you see them down this uh, sort of street scene. Now, our first panel, uh, we split under the window. I'll give you a little technology at the time. Uh, we had terrible troubles with trying to level it and get the window in. The windows were applied on the job. Uh, we've also had uh, uh, some leaks uh, that we've had to go back and butyl caulk, and, and uh, after uh, uh, a couple of years now, we have all of these fairly well solved. But it, it needed, technologically, uh, it needed refinement. It was a good experiment at the time. It did what we wanted. The second panel came into this. Now, these were to be men's dormitories, and unfortunately, they've done the same thing to us. They're, they're uh, uh, co-ed dorms. They, but we evolved a better joint. We did put it in the column, but uh, uh, it's a, um, a vortex type thing where you get your, uh, uh, your, <laughs> your packing out here. Uh, in this case, it is a butyl again. Uh, then back in behind the butyl, there's a hole where the wind can dissipate. If it does get a leak in it, then the condensation run down and weep out at each floor line. So we won't have that problem. The windows here were installed in the factory and came to the site, and of course we didn't have this. This went up just marvelously uh, uh, in its uh, quickness. Now this was around a square plan, because uh, even with all of our research on the last rectangular plan, we found that the people on the north side really didn't know the people on the south side. There was such a division down through them. You got off the elevator, you turned right or left, and you didn't know the people on the other side. So we put this into a square form. And this has worked exceedingly well. All of the utilities are in a square center spine, and the precast wraps around it. Uh, there are uh, some uh, uh, 12 uh, uh, students to each one of these sides. And uh, for some reason, this has broken the pattern, and everyone seems to know one another on a floor, 48 to a floor, the uh, finished thing. These are our new ones that are now under construction. Uh, they will be some 16 stories because our land densities have gotten so tremendous, or rather what happened was that they ran out of money in the land purchasing category. We have two residence halls, one on top of the other, men in the first seven floors, uh, women in the next seven with a uh, 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 social uh, administration floor. Here on 10, you enter high-rise elevators, go up to the social administration floor, and then each section has an internal elevator that that uh, services it. Uh, it's really on the top floor, it's almost a walk up, walk down condition uh, of uh, three and four. Uh, these, this was our first design for it. I thought you'd be interested in seeing the changes that had to be made in the technology. And uh, I think I, if I can go back to this one. 
I think really it's, it's turned out to be uh, uh, much uh, stronger uh, in its revisions. Uh, the economies of it just dictated it. It's, uh, it's a powerful thing. It's much better proportioned than uh, the things that we've had before in this very architectonic uh, uh, piece that, uh, uh, that we have here. We've also found that by, um, uh, we were forced to go into a smooth gray concrete and um, we, um, uh, uh, by doing this, we found that really we're into a better uh, piece of architecture than we were when we were experimenting with the, or trying to experiment uh, with various uh, uh, cosmetics on the exterior in the way of pebbles or quartz. And these are the ones under construction. You can see that they're fairly true to what you saw in the rendering. Um, I'm going to skip through this because of time. This is the Evansville campus study, and um, I was uh, bringing some of these things in. As a matter of fact, I'm going to go rather fast. Uh, we won't have time for questions, and I know that uh, you just have to leave some things out. We do a lot of study by model. Uh, this is the Delta Upsilon fraternity at... Uh, back on models, uh, yeah, all right. This is the, um, uh, the model that we made of the first... Um, uh, well, really, we just, we just did one scheme on this one, and it was uh, much to the client's uh, satisfaction. Uh, uh, this is a plan that we actually had to orient by a north-south, east-west azimuth because there are no two walls that parallel one another in this. And it still turned out to be a very economical building if you use your technologies right. We could go to, we couldn't use double T's in this one, but we could use uh, uh, the uh, flat slab precast because these can be sawed on the job as easy as you can saw wood. So you have to, to know your technologies today to be able to get your variances. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and the building, I think, follows along very well, even though it uh, comes along in a different color. This was another view of that model from the backside. You'll notice this little uh, fireplace sort of thing over here, and I tried to get much the same view of it uh, as I took the pictures a little harder. <laughs> Can't stand up on a tabletop. And take your pictures. <laughs> this is um, a model of the uh, Delta uh, Zeta House, which has just been constructed down at Bloomington, an entirely different uh, technique that we have adapted for a lot that was so close, surrounded by fraternities, and we had, again had to turn it in on its own environment to get to it, uh, sort of a variety of things. Um, I'm just not going to have time to go through all of these. This, these are some of the ways that we approached Wabash College. I'm sorry. We went back because we were told here that we were to do the first contemporary piece at Wabash College, uh, but they wanted it to be compatible. So we actually went back into photographs of places like Williamsburg to study skylines and to come up with roofscapes in low-rise uh, buildings are so definitive to the layman. Uh, uh, more so, really, than, than what patterns appear. I'm, I'm fully convinced on, uh, on buildings, and, and so these were some of our studies as they evolved. The heavy overhang for the shadow, the reveal of the window uh, in their load-bearing walls, but in our precast things, we just uh, could do them differently. The poking through of the skyline. And uh, that's a very dark picture, but this was uh, one of the first uh, renderings, or the final rendering, actually. And you can see how this uh, evolved. Uh, to um, set back. This was the interior of this fraternity house where we modulated the clear story, much as the shutters would have modulated the light um, on a uh, uh, colonial building, a very nice feeling as the, the light comes through to be broken up by the shutter thing. Now, can I take just a, a couple minutes more and, and go into some of the work that I question? Some of this is in Canada. And I want you to make or be thinking about these judgments. This is the residence hall in smooth gray, in situ concrete, at the University of Washington. It's, um, it's not a great piece of architecture. I think a strength goes, but it is interesting. It certainly gives a, it's a viable. It, it really gives you the feeling that this is a residence hall. It's loved by the kids. I spent four hours just going from room to room. Uh, now, some of it is the university policy. This is a really mixed residence hall. They, the uh, boys and girls occupy the same floor here. You have, um, um, uh, 
I used to have a, before I saw that there were girls in the audience, I used to have a little thing about there being more agile girls on the campus of Washington, but I won't say it this time. They, uh, uh, <laughs> they have a, 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 a grouping around a living room uh, that has a single room, two single rooms, a room for two people, a room for three people. They're not very fancy, but each one of these suites has a balcony. And, and each suite then arranges its own rules as to how they entertain, who they let in, and it was, it was alive. It was, uh, it was an apartment house uh, for young adults, and it was very well used. Nobody's jumped, there are no guardrails. Uh, uh, it's way up above, uh, you know, uh, 300 feet up on this uh, cliff. Uh, uh, I don't know how they ever got the courage to do something like this when we, when we so often find these, uh, uh, these overtones that, well, really, we, we better not make the windows movable because somebody's apt to fall out of it. At what point do you become an adult so that you can live in adult architecture? This is a thing that, that uh, uh, we, we have to be able to convince uh, people through, I think, these behavioral studies that, uh, that people don't necessarily jump. And if they're gonna jump, they're gonna jump from someplace, so they might as well jump at home. <laughs> They made use of every square inch in here. They put, uh, uh, it wasn't very handsome. Boy, the walls were barren and there were no curtains. And uh, uh, the kids slept on a, this was a real pad. <laughs> they slept on a, on a piece of foam rubber on top of their chest. And, uh, uh, but it was marvelous. It was just, frankly, look at the closet. that doesn't even run up to the wall. You know, you see all the shoes falling out down below and all the stuff ticky-tacked up at the top. But this didn't bother him. So where is this thing of visual environment? But here was the living room. Each one, each student furnished their own. They all got together and, and uh, bought furniture out of uh, used places. Some were furnished in antiques, some were furnished in, in contemporary. Uh, they let this area of living be manipulated by the individual. I think this was the first clue. Secondly, they treated the person living here as an adult and put some responsibility on it. I think this is the second thing. These have absolutely nothing to do with architecture, so the architecture therefore then becomes secondary, and maybe it should in residential work. But it certainly is, uh, uh, it's, it's exciting, uh, you feel it. Uh, earlier in the day, these balconies were just loaded with cocktail parties, you know? They, that's another thing they do there. <laughs> now, when I went up to Toronto, why, um, old Charlie did me a good favor uh, last summer. He said, by gosh, if you ever get to Toronto, you see Scarborough. It's a dynamo, and it is. It's a strong piece of architecture. It's beautiful. These things were taken at night from the campus entrance. Uh, uh, just uh, uh, the form, the, the, it, it's, it's sculpturing on the horizon. As of the week that I had been there, there had been three psychologists giving lectures on what a horrible environment this was for students. Why? They said it overpowered them. They said that you can't develop a student in things like this. Are they talking about the exterior? I don't know. I don't really believe so, but maybe they're talking about this kind of an interior, where in a contiguous building, this is your street. On the survey that we did at Evansville, which is one of our latest things before we did that plan that I skipped through so hurriedly, the one thing that we found came back to us from all of the students, I can't say that or he'll kill me, most of the students, <laughs> uh, 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 that they were willing to put up with all types of um, inconveniences if it would lend itself to a visual experience that would get them out of the building and to a, uh, uh, to a differentiation of, of, of landscape. Now, granted, Toronto has, a, uh, has tremendous problems with snow that Evansville doesn't have. But uh, on the other hand, this is known as Fort Scarborough. <laughs> The smooth gray doesn't look so good on the inside. Boy, it's nice on the outside. Uh, it's handsome to this architect because I've been cultured to it. And in talking to Lon about this, he said, yes, but you know, musicians 
can get very esoteric about things you can't hear. And painters can do the same, and any group can have its architects architect. And is this what we're designing for? Is this the reason that this isn't well-liked or overpowering? I don't know the answer. And the thing that frightens me, in, in a world where we have to re rebuild, we have to rebuild it as right, but we also have to build it again in 40 years, we don't have time for failures. We don't have time for experimentation. When a president of an East Coast college says, I can't understand why you gave this man the gold medal, he'll never be allowed on this campus again. There is a dichotomy between what we're producing and what we think is great and what the public thinks is great as an environment. And maybe we're not, maybe we get so interested and so wrapped up in this sculptural approach and our exteriors and our overkill with design that we're not really thinking in terms that today what we're doing is we're surrounding interior space for human use. And human use is the thing that carries all the way through every type of architecture today. This architecture is based on humanism, on humanity on its comforts and what it expects uh, in, in, in its return. It's not based on God, it's not based on government, it's not based on the professor, no one stands up when he comes in the class, it's based on the student and what he can learn in this environment. And evidently, this isn't a learning environment. And I can't understand why this isn't a learning environment if that other barren thing is a living environment at Washington. Khan's work at Pennsylvania, absolutely detested by the people who have to live in. I took this when it was being built. I went back two years later, and every one of these beautiful windows is covered with aluminum foil to keep out the solar gain. <clears throat> We're missing the boat. We're getting our data wrong somehow. Not a very handsome building, a real... Uh, 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 Why go to the architect's ball? You've got your psychedelic thing right there. Well, that's the end. What I'm saying to you is, I don't know these answers. I don't know if anyone else has them. Lon Wheeler raised one more question in which I'll close on. The anthropologist Paul Hall questioned whether People really can live in the same kind of housing. I drove down into the Watts area, and I didn't find a slum like Detroit has. But I came to the conclusion, as I told my dinner partners tonight, that I'd be alienated anywhere in Los Angeles. That's just a city that's devoted principally to the motor car. There's no humanity in it. Now, what Hall is saying, as well as an anthropologist, is what are the cultural overtones in, this, uh, in, in our society? Can North Europeans live in the same kind of houses as South Europeans? Um, what, how many generations of uh, being in a melting pot does it take before we become all the same people? Can an architect from a strata of society that has been used to certain things designed for a strata of society that is not used to things. These are the things that we have to find out because if we don't, the systems analyst boys are going to do it for us.